the guys who just served this week at camp, um, just a big thank you to all the leaders, all the volunteer leaders. I don't see many here. Oh, he has a few in the front row. Um, but yeah, just thank you for going on camp. I know it's a long time, um, and yeah, I guess there's minimal sleep. But I was just um, reflecting, and I don't know, I was sharing this with a few people sometime this week about um, when I was young, and I also went on a youth camp, and um, I loved going on camps because they were the, the best times of my life. And I can remember just coming back, and especially one time when I came back, and I think I was probably, I don't know, under 10, I think, and I can remember just crying and weeping like because I was so sad I was missing camp. It was just such a cool time. And so, yeah, all the leaders who invest in all the young people and all the parents who actually send your kids to our camps, um, I feel like you're actually investing in them and um, doing such an awesome job at sending them to camps because they come back just so inspired, encouraged, probably tired, um, but actually learning about God. And um, I think that's the most valuable thing for them. So, yeah, just thanks. And can we give them all a hand? <laughs> who are you? Maybe... Most of them will be at the 11 a.m. I don't know. Thanks, George. I know you were there. And um, yeah, everyone else. So, hey, we're halfway through the year. Um, we're halfway through the Bad Advice series. And I thought I just want to push pause today and ask you guys, how are you going? All right. And the reason I'm asking this question is because at the beginning of the year, I don't know if you're anything like me, but maybe you had a few goals. Maybe when you embarked on 2020, um, you jotted a few things down and you were like, man, this is the year. These are some of the things that I want to be doing. And so we're halfway through the year. And even um, you know, during lockdown, I know after lockdown, all the conversations that I was hearing is, man, I've learned so much during lockdown, right? When I come out of lockdown, I'm going to change my schedule. I'm going to prioritize people. When I walk past people down the street, I'm going to wave at them. I'm going to smile at them. Um, I'm just going to, you know, I'm not going to consume how I used to. So did, did any of you, can you relate? Did you jot some things like that down? Did you make some mental notes of those things? So how are you going with that? <laughs> We're going okay? Some thriving? Not? Horrible. <laughs> well, this, this week, um, Zali and I went out for dinner when she came back from camp. And we have this little book that um, when we started dating, the day we started dating, um, which was really easy to remember because it was the 1st of January, all right, um, we got this book and we actually jotted down some of our bucket list ideas, like some of the things we'd really like to achieve. Um, and jotted down some things on our bucket list. Um, we jotted some professional goals that we actually want to achieve. Um, we jotted down some relationship goals, like, hey, what do we actually want to have in our relationship? And then also we jotted down some um, prayer requests, things that we were praying for in this book. And so every now and then, um, we have a date night, or we just you know, go to some place, and we go through this book, and we just check, hey, how are we going? But one of the sections in the book is actually who we're becoming. And we jotted down some things of who we'd actually like to be, what other people hopefully would say about us. And um, we went through the, the book this week, and um, one of the things we jotted down was get a puppy, all right? That was probably two years ago. And we ticked that off because now we've got the puppy, and um, there were a few other things. But when we got to that section of who are we becoming, um, both, of, both of us just felt like, man, we're, we're not actually achieving what we really want to be achieving. Um, we just felt like, hey, we're, we're missing the mark. And um, I think some of us could maybe relate with that. You know, some of the things we're setting out to, to achieve or, or the people we want to become, like by evaluating, we see like, hey, maybe um, we're not there yet. And the question I want to ask us today is actually... This question will come up soon. Is what is wrong with us, right? <laughs> what is wrong with us? Why, why aren't we able to achieve the things that we really set out to achieve? And why aren't we able to become the people that we really want to become? 
And why is it that, you know, during lockdown, we had so many ambitions um, on the other side of lockdown, but we seem to be missing the mark? And I think to answer this question, there could be literally a million answers, right? But at the root of it, and I was hesitant to actually speak about this, but I think at the root of it is this word that we don't often speak about, and it's sin. What do you mean? Where's how, how can sin be the problem with all of us not achieving what we really want to be achieving, becoming who we really want to become? And we don't use this word often, sin, and I mean, we probably never use it in our conversations with each other. No one actually says, hey man, this week I sinned, right? We, does anyone say that? You may, but I don't think any of us actually use that word in our conversations. But sin, um, a great definition of this is um, this definition of missing the mark. The Bible always speaks about sin as something as we're missing the mark. And if you think about it, it's it's sort of like if, if I had a dartboard, right, and um, I was aiming for the bullseye, um, and I kept missing, and I kept like throwing on the sides or, or piercing the wall, um, that would be missing the mark. And so actually the ideal is that I actually hit the bullseye for my life, but I keep missing the mark. And it's not as if, you know, it's wrong to not hit the bullseye, but it's actually, hey, there's something better if you hit the bullseye. Does that make sense? It's the same if I had to go out and play basketball now and I needed to try and shoot and score and maybe I'd keep hitting the rim. I'd be missing the mark. But if I got it in, swish, then um, I'd actually be achieving this. But sin, I think, is something that comes into our lives and um, it's, it deceives us, all right, and it steals from us. And um, one of the things that we got in the next slide is it's, this is a great definition of it. It's if we know we need to change something, right? But we choose to stay the same, it's sin, right? Now hear me out today before you throw rocks at me. If we know we need to change something, but we choose to stay the same, it's sin. And like I thought, man, this definition actually makes it so more real because, I mean, it's easy for me to say, like, oh, I know there's something I need to do and say, oh, but I'll do it tomorrow. Or like, oh, it doesn't really matter if I call that person and say sorry. Or like, you know, it, all these thoughts come up into my mind of things that I need to, to do, all right? I know I need to do this, but then I intentionally choose to stay the same, then it's sin. A couple of weeks ago, Zalia spoke about um, good people, the, the bad advice of good people going to heaven. And actually, Paul illustrated what sin was when he records it like this. He says, sin is, the wages of sin is what? It's death, all right? And uh, I'm guessing all of us, we sit here, but, but where's, like, all of us have sinned, right? We all sin, and I'm still alive. So how does this actually make sense? And, you know, we're all going to die in any case, so what does it actually matter? But you see, what sin does is, is, it, is it destroys, and there's a death that happens in, in all our environments, in our lives. There's a death in our relationship. There's a death in our confidence. There's a death in, in our trust when we lie to each other. And this is what sin does. Sin comes in, and it sort of destroys. And so today, I, wa I wanted to speak a bit about this bad advice and actually how how can we actually get better at this? How can we actually conquer this sin problem? Because actually, if you don't understand anything about who Jesus is, is Jesus actually wants to eradicate the sin problem, right? Because this is what separates us from a relationship with Jesus. And the whole reason sin, um, the wages of sin is death, and the whole thing about that is actually Jesus' life and Jesus cares about each and every one of us. Each and every one of us matters. And therefore, he wants us to actually be able to have the best for our lives. He wants us to hit the mark. He wants us to actually achieve the bar and not be yeah, at the bottom all the time. So how do we actually go about this? So today I thought, hey, the bad advice that I actually want to share with you is the bad advice that we tell ourselves. Not from someone else, 
but actually the bad advice that we tend to tell ourselves. And how can we actually move away from sin? Sin is recorded all throughout the, the Bible, and, and how do we actually move away from it? So in order to do that today, I want us to look at a passage, and it's found in the book of James. Um, James wrote the book of James, and um, he was Jesus' half-brother. And um, what he writes about today, I think, is going to give us a picture of um, how we can actually overcome sin and what sin actually does in our lives. So we're going to pick it up. It's in chapter 1, verse 13, and this is what it says. It says, When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. And what James is embarking on, yeah, like straight away, he's saying when tempted. In other words, all of us are going to be tempted, all right? At some time, we are going to be tempted. It doesn't matter if you're the pastor. It doesn't matter your age, your skin color, all right? It doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian. Or if you're not a Christian, you're actually going to be tempted, all right? You're going to be tempted, Um and he says, hey, but just understand that God doesn't tempt us, right? God doesn't try and lead us to miss the mark. That isn't God, right? And then he goes on and he says, but each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their what? What does it say? Their own evil desire. What James is revealing to us here is he's saying, hey, the reason we are tempted and the reason we dragged away is because of our own evil desire. In other words, each one of us has some evil desires in us that actually look really good, look, look really attractive, but actually this is what's leading us into sin. And he says, and enticed. And, and when you think of this enticed, um, it shows us that there, there must be an enticer. There must be an enemy. And one of the things that we think about is, in the narrative of the Bible is that there's an enemy, that there's the devil who's actually trying to come and steal and destroy from our lives, and that he's trying to also lead us down the wrong path. So I love this. James reveals to us, he says, hey, when you tempted, know that the reason you're being tempted is because, number one, of what? Your own evil desires, all right? And maybe also there's a partnership by the enemy, the enticer who's trying to lead you down the wrong path. Um, and oh, the, 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 the crux of this is that no one is a victim. We all volunteers. In other words, we actually willingly volunteer for this, all right? We put up our hands and we say, yes, this is the evil desires that I actually want, because we don't see it as something that, that is going to lead us to death. We never see it that way. And so yeah, some of the, the, um, the faulty advice or the bad advice or the lies that I think we can relate with that we often tell ourselves. They go like this. The first one is, and honestly, you could probably make a list of about a hundred of these lies. First one is, I can avoid the consequences, right? Like, where's, I've, I've done this before. Like, I know the loophole. I know how to get out of it. Like, honestly, I'm old enough. I've, I've done life quite well, so I can actually avoid all the consequences. Or we say, I'm not as bad as so-and-so, right? In other words, like, I mean, I know my flatmates, I mean, honestly, they drink a lot, man, but I'm not as bad as them. I'm, you know, if I have to compare, I'm pretty good. And like all the things I do compared to all the things that those other people do, like I'm, I'm, I'm okay. Maybe some of the other bad advice we tell ourselves is I deserve this, right? How many times do we tell ourselves that we actually deserve this? <laughs> yeah. Could be just in something simple, all right? That, hey, you know what? No, I've actually done the hard work. And you know, if everyone else is, is getting other things, then I, I deserve this. Maybe some of the other faulty advice that we follow is that I'm missing out. 
I'm missing out. And this is, this is a common one that I've heard so often. And especially even in the framework of Christianity, like, you know, I, I want to be a Christian. I want to live for God. I want to follow Jesus. But honestly, I feel like I'm missing out. Like I look out at the world and I see everyone else doing everything that they want to. And I'm like, man, I'm, I'm missing out. There's this FOMO. Maybe some of the other faulty advice we believe is, I've always been this way. Like, Wes, this is just who I am. This is, this is part of my, my family. My dad was like this. My, my family heritage is, is, is all like this. And, and, and what we're actually excusing is, or, or what we're actually saying is that, okay, that, that there's no room for change. What we're actually saying is that, hey, God isn't able to do something supernatural in your life. And we believe these lies, this bad advice. Maybe it's everybody else is doing it. I mean, everybody else is doing it, so, so therefore God doesn't take it that serious, right? I mean, honestly, if I look at the world and I see everyone else, what they're doing in their lives, then, then it's like, oh, I can also do that. I mean, there isn't a standard anymore, like everyone else is doing it, so hey, why well, I can do it myself. This is the faulty advice, the bad advice we give ourselves. Or maybe it's, I can handle it. I can handle it. I've done this before, and I was okay, so I can do this. I'm strong enough. I'm brave enough. Maybe it's also, um, one time won't hurt, right? Bad advice we tell ourselves, one time won't hurt. Little do we, do we or, or we do know that, you know, the reason for habits and stuff is all started on that one time, right? Just that one time. These are the lies we believe. One time won't hurt. And the last two that I wrote down is nobody will know. And I like this one. Because this is something we tell ourselves all the time. Like, nobody will know, right? <laughs> In other words, like, hey, we're only holding ourselves accountable to people who see us or who see our actions. Like nobody else will know. So, so this, is, this is okay to actually do. But God's like, no, man, you're missing the mark. There's actually so much more for your life. And the last one I jotted down is, but I'm in love. Like, Wes, you don't know. Like, man, we're in love. We're in love. So we just, you know, we're just going to do this, even though it's, it's wrong. We just feel like that this is the right thing to do. And like love and sin actually can't coexist. They don't. These are, these are the sort of the bad advice that we tell ourselves. And, and these are the evil desires that James is actually recording here and saying, hey, it's because of our own evil desires. It's because of our own self-talk. And with the backup of the enemy you know, speaking and saying, hey, this, this is a good idea. Why not go for it? So what does this do? Where does this lead to? James continues, and oh, and actually, before we go, the temptations always hide themselves as rational thoughts. If you think about it, like any temptation and all these lies that we speak to ourselves about, they become rational. It's like, yeah, this is, this is okay. This seems right. This is, this is good. But then James goes on and he actually shares where this actually leads to. And I love his description of this. Okay, but each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. And then he says this. He says, then after desire has conceived, right? After our desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. I love the way he is, is, is writing this. He says, hey, when that desire is actually conceived, it gives birth to sin, sin which leads to death. And he says, and sin, when it is full grown, all right, in other words, it, it sort of breeds and it gets bigger and bigger. And when it is full grown, it gives birth to, and you fill in the blank. This is what I filled in. I, I filled in, it gives birth to happiness, right? Because that's what we believe. That's the bad advice we tell ourselves. We say, like, if I do all these things, honestly, 
this is what's going to happen. It's going to give birth to sin, and, and it, as it grows, it, it's going to give me happiness. It's going to bring me joy. The other word I, I filled in here is it gives birth to contentment. Like I'll be content when I just have this. What is your, your blank that you fill in? These are the lies, the bad advice that we tell ourselves. But James, as he records it, he says, it gives birth to death. It gives birth to death. Think of that picture. Something that should come to life, something that sh should, should be so um, life-giving, as soon as it's born, matures, and it just becomes death. I thought of this um, in the context of a spider bite. You know, ha has anyone ever had a spider bite? I've had a spider bite from, I don't know what spider it was, and um, it was on my leg, and honestly, it just looked like a little, um, what would you call it, a pimple, I guess, just a little small little dot on my leg, and um, I thought it was just like a, maybe an ingrown hair or something, and then it got a bit bigger, and a bit bigger, and this small little pimple turned into this, um, pretty much looked like a boil full of like gruesome pus, okay, visualize this, yeah, all right, that's what it looks like, all right, and then um, what happens is like you can't just pop it or anything, and eventually it will pop, and then like it caves in, it steals part of, of, of your leg, it's like this, this hole, Google it, YouTube it tonight, all right, check it out, tea time, yeah, but this is what Paul is actually trying to show us what sin does. He's saying, don't be deceived. Like, this is what sin does. It, it gives birth. Our evil desires give birth to sin, and then it matures. All right? There's this process where, where maybe at first we think, oh, it's harmless. It's just a little baby. It's, it's not going to do anything to us. But then it grows bigger, and it becomes a mature adult, and it leads to death. And then James goes on, and he says, hey, don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Don't be misled. Like, guys, open your eyes. Don't listen to the bad advice that you keep following. Stop thinking that this is going to bring you contentment, happiness, all the things that you really want it to bring you, because this is just covered up, and it's just sin. It leads to death. And, and I love his language. He says, my dear brothers and sisters. In other words, he's, he's, he's not trying to guilt you into anything. James isn't yeah, trying to record this and, and make you feel guilty of your sin. That's not what he's doing. He's just trying to picture, and I can see this in his language, because he says, dear brothers and sisters. In other translations, he says, dearly beloved. He's saying, hey, because you matter, because I care about you, because God cares about you, be careful of this thing that wants to destroy you and take over your life. And then he ends it with a complete contrast where he says, now every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Yeah, James, now contrast this, this whole thing of sin, of being tempted by our evil desires. And he says on the other end, hey, every good and perfect thing, all right, every good and mature gift is actually from God. And, and I love the language he says here, Father of the heavenly lights. In other words, the whole purpose of God is the Father who wants to bring light into your life. He wants to... He wants to bring light into your deception, where you're being deceived, where you're thinking, hey, sin looks attractive, and that this can be really good for us. He's bringing in and actually trying to reveal light and saying, hey, every good and perfect gift comes from our Father, who comes from above. And then he says, and it does not change like these shifting um, shadows. And he ends off with this. He says, he chose to give us birth through the word of truth. 
So he says, hey, there's this birth of sin, but he has the, he has the contrast. He has this birth through the word of truth. When he speaks about truth, yeah, he speaks about the word. He speaks about Jesus. He speaks about Jesus who is the life giver, who is the light of the world. He says that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. The first fruits, in other words, the best of the crop. Every good gift that God wants to bring into your life comes from, comes from this truth, from this birth. I love what James is describing here because I don't know about you, but this is what I struggle with. This is what I wrestle with. This, this is the tension where actually the things I want to actually achieve, I, I'm not meeting the bar because there's this enemy that comes in that's trying to steal and destroy and take away. Now, the best part of, of what I want to share today is this, is this ending. We're actually, you can only understand this if you understand who Jesus is and what he's really done for us. Now, in the book of Hebrews, we'll turn there, Jesus is referred to, this, referred to as the high priest, all right? And we're not exactly sure who, who wrote the book of Hebrews, but we know that the audience was probably Jews who actually became Christians, all right? And so the language that he uses here is, is this context of a high priest, a high priest who, who would actually go into the synagogue, who would go into the sanctuary, and he would actually take upon himself all the sins of the nation of Israel. Every single one of them, he'd take all that he, and he'd place it on the lamb as a slaughter who would actually take the punishment for all of the nation's sin. And yeah, he records this and he says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. I love what he's saying here. He's saying, hey, we have this high priest, all right? His name is Jesus, who is interceding for us. In other words, when we're struggling with the sin, he's trying to actually help us to defeat it. And he says, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. In other words, hey, let's trust. Let's believe in the truth. Let's lean into the truth. And the awesome part about this is this part here where he says, if we go to the next slide, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. This is absolutely incredible that the God who we actually serve can empathize with us in the context of temptation and missing the mark. That our God that we serve, Jesus Christ, is the only God who actually comes to this earth as a human being, lives a life the exact same way that we would live a life, and yet without sin, so that he can empathize with our weaknesses. In other words, God doesn't look down on us and on our sin because he can empathize and he knows the danger, the struggle, the death that sin actually causes in our life. He can empathize. And the best part of it is even though he was tempted in every way possible that we are, he did not sin. He conquered sin. And therefore, this is what what the author writes then. He says, we should do this. He says, now let us then approach God's throne of grace with what? With confidence, all right? With confidence. I don't know if you know what confidence is, but confidence means we can come just as we are, trusting, hey, that there is a God who is for us. He says, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. I love this. 
This is the God we serve. This is the God that there is no other God like Him. No other God. No other God has come to this earth, lived a life like this, paid the price for every single human being's sin so that we can be in relationship with Him. And nothing can separate us from that relationship now because He's paid that price of sin. I will still experience the consequences of sin, but our relationship with God is solid because of who Jesus is and what he has done for us. This changes everything, and I love this because we can now approach God, and we don't have to approach him by doing stuff. We don't have to approach him by performing better. We can approach him, and when we approach him, we receive mercy, and we find grace for where we're falling short. And you know what he does? He brings light into our lives because he's the father of light. He brings light into our lives that shows us, hey, this is sin. This is not good for us. You're missing the mark. I've paid the price for that. So, hey, I'm going to help you and guide you in the right way. I love this. This is what honestly just brings me so much joy about the gospel. Today, I know that each and every one of us here matter to God immensely, immensely. I'm so sad that every day, or I don't know if it's every day, but, but we're you know, persuaded and we're tempted and we go down that wrong path because we're believing bad advice that we tell ourselves that not even Jesus, not even God is telling us. The enemy just wants to come, take away, steal, destroy. But Jesus came to bring us life and life in abundance. Today, I'm going to invite you. I don't know where you are, and I'm, I just want you to bow your heads right now. But, but maybe you've never grasped this whole concept of who Jesus is. But there's one thing that, that Jesus is, and that he'll always be. And that is victorious over sin. And I want to invite you to actually, because what he says is, is he wants us to actually invite him into our lives, into our hearts, so that we don't wrestle with this by ourselves. We actually say, hey, Jesus, I want to partner with you. I want to invite you into my heart. I want you to not just change me from the outside, but from the inside out. So today as we pray and as we end off. Maybe as I've been speaking, you know some of that sin that you're wrestling with, some of the stuff that's, that's separating you, some of the stuff that's, that's making you not reach the bar that even you want to achieve. And I want to invite you to invite Jesus into that space today. Father God, we're, we're so grateful that you pay the price for our sins, God. We're so grateful that you're a God who cares about us. We're so grateful that nothing can separate us from the love that you have for us, God. And God, when when we're tempted and, and when we swayed down the wrong path, help us to see your love that you still have for us, God. Help us to see your mercy. Help us to see your grace. And today we invite you into those spaces in our lives that that are dark, God, where sin is actually reigning and maybe it's just birthed and it's growing, God. And, And we pray that you can come in there and you can actually just change our perspective, God. Can you lead us on on a better direction? Today we accept the gift that you give us in your grace. And we pray that you can come into our lives, God, and help us as we journey together in this life, is our prayer in Jesus' name.